Hi, I'm Marcus Curtis from Marcus Curtis Music, and we have been going through a series that teaches people how to use any Behringer X32 with the Cakewalk DAW application. So you can use multiple tracks to record your music using your Windows PC. So as you know, Cakewalk is now free, and if you own any X32, you have the ability to record your music professionally. During the course of this video series, many questions came up in the comment section about the material I was covering. And in many cases, it's hard to give an answer using a text format. A more visual representation is needed. In addition to this, some people had feature requests they wanted me to cover in more detail. And some people gave helpful tips in the common area, but they were hard to visualize. So welcome to the very first Behringer Cakewalk Q&A session. I want to address the problems and the issues people are having in the comment section. I might not be able to get to your particular problem or your feature request in this video, but I'm going to try to address everyone's comments in the next two videos, this one being video one. So let's get started. I can't even pronounce this first guy's name, so I'm just going to call you Kelm. And Kelm says, I was able to record a live performance using the USB recording. It has a full band and vocals. I have the recording in WAV format. Is there a way to re-record the whole session, adding reverb, etc., and taking out certain points of the file? So let me see if I have this right. You recorded a session using a thumb drive and the uh, recorder built into the Behringer X32 mixer, and now you want to add reverb and compression to that uh, recording, right? In this case, yes. You can still use sonar to add dynamic effects like compression and EQ. All you have to do is insert that same thumb drive into the computer. And then start Cakewalk and open up a project. And once that project is open, go over to File and Import. Go to Import Audio. And once that comes up, click on the song you want to add the effects to and just click Open. And once that opens up, pull that down a little bit so you can see the whole audio file. Then in the effects bin, just add the things you want to add. In this case, let's add a multi-band compressor. We'll use a Sinitis multi-band compressor. And then once that opens, we'll just start by loading a preset. We'll just do a basic mastering preset. And then you go in and adjust the preset where it needs to be adjusted. I always use presets as a jumping off point. But once you get your song in there, adjust the preset the way you want. And then uh, go up to uh, export audio and then pick what you want, say an MP3. And then this uh, window comes up and just export it. There's a different way to export audio that I prefer to use. And let me show that to you. Let's go up to um, file and this time go down to export, then go to export audio. And see, you have a different uh, window here. And just go to the folder where you want to export the song. Make sure that you're on 44. 0.1k, make sure you're on 16-bit, add dithering, do the uh, power 3 dithering, it's the best dithering in sonar, in my opinion, and then um, change it to mp3, and then go ahead and put a title in, and in this case we'll change the title, let's make it uh, song demo, and then you hit export. Once that happens, the mp3 box will come up, you click enable high pass filter and enable low pass filter, variable rate encoding, take the quality slider all the way to the left, then encode your metadata into the mp3, then click OK, then it begins to export as you can see, and then you're done. So from this point, just go to the folder where you've exported the file, let's call it Windows Explorer, and then we'll navigate to the folder it's in, and you can see there's our export at mp3 file. Kelm has a follow-up question. Is there a way for me to separate the vocals from the instruments? Unfortunately, you cannot remove the vocals from a single audio track. Now, the recorder on the mixer combines all the instruments and the vocals into a single audio file. Now, there are programs that claim they can do this, but all they really do is they isolate certain frequencies where the vocals reside, and they remove those frequencies. And this makes the audio sound terrible, and you can still hear the vocals faintly in the background, and it doesn't totally remove them. Now, there might be a program out there that I don't know about, but I have not found one yet. 
However, I do have a suggestion for future projects. All you really need to do when you want to record something is to use Cakewalk instead of the recorder built into the mixer. And it's a simple process as you're seeing it unfold right here. All you have to do is go in and create 16 tracks in a Cakewalk project and then save that as a template. That's the beauty of templates is that you don't have to create the same project over and over again. You just save it as a template and then you open up a new project from that template. And all you do is you route every channel that's in the Behringer X32 to a track that's in Sonar. And then you're good to go. And when you're all done, go ahead and arm all those tracks. Now everybody has their own track and you can go in and remove the vocals later on or you can even add things that you weren't able to record. Perfect solution to the problem. Jeff has a request. He said, would you please touch on the metronome and how to enter multiple time signatures and beats per minute in a single take? Okay, let's dive into it. All right, let's start out by going to new project and we're gonna open up an empty project once that's done, we're going to hit I to close the inspector and B to close the browser. I'm going to hit the D and I'm going to call up the multi-dock. We're going to bring this up so you can see it better. Now we have three buses. We have the master bus and that's the default bus. And if you right click, you can see it's set as the default bus. That means that you can go over here and right click and insert an audio track and you will see that it's routed to the master automatically. And the bus is also routed to the master as well. And every time you create a bus, it will route to the master. Now we have the preview bus and this bus basically is tied to the browser. It allows you to uh, hear back audio and you can control the volume with the slider. This is the metronome bus and that's tied to the metronome which is in this area. Let's explain a little bit more about that later. But remember these three buses because we're going to uh, reference them later. We're going to close out the window by hitting the D and we're going to pull our track down a little bit further. So these are the three buttons that control the metronome. Okay. And then we're going to go over to edit and, and we're going to go down to preferences. Any settings that can be adjusted in Cakewalk can be adjusted in preferences. For example, you can adjust the driver settings. Any settings that can be adjusted in Sonar is adjusted in the Preferences window. So we can close this out and you can call up Preferences by hitting P on the keyboard. It comes right up. Okay, so our metronome settings is found under Project. And when you click on that, these are all the settings that adjust the metronome. Okay, now this is found in Project and Project is only available when a project is open. And the settings in here only reflect the current project that is open. Okay, so let's go ahead and close this out. Let's go over the metronome in more detail. So you have three buttons here. If you hit this button on the bottom, you see that the preferences window opens and uh, it opens under the metronome tab. This is like a shortcut. Okay, so if you want to hear the metronome during playback, you make sure that the playback box is checkmarked. Make sure the recording box is check mark if you want to hear the metronome during the recording process. So if we close this out, you'll see that both these buttons are lit out. Now, if you want to turn off the metronome during playback, just hit the playback button. And if you want to turn off the metronome during recording, just hit the recording button. Now the metronome is completely turned off. And to turn it on, just click the same buttons again and it turns on the metronome. When you call it the metronome, this section right here is the record count in. This gives you an allotted time that the metronome will play before the recording actually starts. Now you have your choice of measures or beats. We're going to go to measures and we're going to set a two measure count in time. So now the metronome will play two measures before it actually starts recording the song. So we're going to close this out. We're going to arm this for recording for our, an example here. And once we hit record, you should hear a two measure count in before the recording starts. And now our recording starts.
So notice when we recorded the audio track, we recorded a little bit of the metronome too. Don't worry about this now. We're going to address this later. I'm going to show you how to fix that. Okay, so for now though, let's go up to edit and uh, we're going to go over to undo recording. Now control Z on the keyboard will also undo a recording. So uh, we'll go ahead and hit this and undo the recording. And we're going to go back to our metronome settings. Okay, so this is a beat subdivision. And for example, if you want uh, double time, we'll click on this little arrow here and go down to half. And now we're in double time and we're going to change our record count into one measure. So now let's hit record. We have our one measure count in and everything's in double time. Let's go ahead and undo that. Okay, we're going to get rid of the record count in and we're going to change this back to uh, normal. There are two types of metronomes here. We have the audio metronome and then we also have the MIDI metronome. We're going to go over the audio metronome first. You can change the sounds in the audio metronome because they're just pre-recorded sounds. And uh, we're going to change this to, let's see, how about stick one? And then our other beat will be stick two. Okay. You can also adjust the volume over here and the side. I'm just going to adjust this a little bit. So let's see what this sounds like. Let's close out the preferences window. Okay, so as you can see, there are different sounds available in the metronome. So we're going to undo this recording and we're going to go ahead and open up preferences and we're just going to set everything back to the default settings here so we got the high ping and we have the low ping and while we're at it we'll go ahead and turn the sound down to where it was okay now uh, this uh, this is the output section of the metronome and this is where we control where the signal goes so these are our three buses if you remember from earlier we can let the metronome go to the hardware output if we want to but we're just going to leave it on the metronome output for now okay so this is how the audio metronome works if we would rather use a mini metronome we just click on that and now the audio metronome is grayed out in order for you to use a MIDI metronome, uh, the a MIDI device will have to be set up in preferences. This means you're going to need a control surface, which we don't have set up. And you're also going to have to have a software synth or something open that you can uh, use as a metronome. So uh, it's kind of complicated to set up, a little bit more details to it. I never use it. I just use the audio metronome. So we're, we'll just go back to... Uh, uh, metronome here and we're going to click back on the audio metronome that's really all there is to the metronome feature itself so the metronome is basically tied into the tempo and our time signature so right now we're at 120 and 4-4 timing before we go any further I got an idea why don't we just go ahead and open up um, a software synth and we'll do some drums and we'll go to the SI drum kit and once you open up the window for the first time you should see a simple instrument track to get to this window just click on the SI drum kit twice but you want to select a MIDI source track and a first synth audio track and we're just going to hit OK and now it's going to create the software synth in our project and uh, we no longer need the audio track, so we're going to go ahead and delete that. So let's go ahead and pull down our two tracks, and we'll explain this a little further. Okay, this is our MIDI channel, and this basically handles all of our MIDI files, the MIDI data. This is our audio track, and this basically plays back uh, the MIDI file and turns it into audio. Okay, so here's our drum kit. Here. I'm going to take the MIDI track and move it up. And now let's go ahead and look for some MIDI files. I'm going to audio library. Let's go up. And we're looking for our MIDI library. There it is. Let's go into Smart Loops. Now let's find a file in here. Let's see. How about uh, Funky Thirds? Okay. 
We'll use that one. Okay, I'm just gonna drag it over to our MIDI track. This is a groove clip, and you can tell a groove clip because it has the rounded edges. We're gonna pull it all the way over here to the first measure, and when we pull it out, you can see the, the little edges there. It's gonna copy into each measure. Okay, that's what a groove clip does. So what we need to do is shrink this down the other way. There we go. And now we're gonna go over here to the end of this groove clip and stretch it out. About 35, 30 measures, somewhere around there is about all we need for our example. And it's copied all the way down, so we're gonna pull this all the way up. Okay. So let's close out the inspector. I mean, let's close out the browser, sorry about that. Okay. We're gonna rewind this all the way. Now we have a drum track. Well, you can't hear the metronome, so we're gonna turn it down. We're only using the drums to explain the function of the metronome. That's why they're there, okay. Good. So now, if you wanna change the tempo, all you have to do is click in the tempo window. And let's change it to 100. So we're just going to type 100, and now our tempo is 100. It's going to play much slower. Okay. Let's say you want to insert a timing change on measure 5. Just click on measure 5 to move the now time over to measure 5. Now, if you were to change this back to 120, it would change the whole project to 120. That wouldn't work. So the first thing I usually do is I insert a marker by hitting M on the keyboard, and then I just label it whatever I want. In this case, it'd be tempo change. And click OK. Okay, so we're gonna move our now time. You can see where our marker was inserted. To insert a tempo change, all we have to do is go to project and then go down to insert tempo change. Okay, we can see our current tempo is at 100. Okay, we wanna to go to insert a new tempo. And then you highlight where you want it to go by holding down the left mouse button and then just type five. Now we're going to go up to where it says Tempo, and we're going to highlight that. And then we're going to say 120. Let's go back to 120 and hit OK. Now we've inserted a tempo change at measure 5. So you can see that it's at 100. Now on the other side of the marker, it's at 120. So let's come back to four, uh, measure 4 and give it a listen. Okay, so in our example, uh, we have our tempo change at 5, but let's say we want a gradual slowdown back to 120. And let's say we want it to begin at measure 8 and go all the way to measure 10. So what we're going to do is we're going to move our now time to, temp to measure 8. And we're going to insert another marker by hitting M on the keyboard, and we'll call this uh, tempo change. Uh, now, markers are not necessary, but uh, we use them to help us find uh, sections of our project, and uh, it's easier to locate things so you don't have to hunt for them. Okay, so we've got tempo change. So now, markers help me identify where the tempo changes are, and I can basically spot them easily instead of spending the whole project hunting for them. So use markers, get in the habit of it, and you'll find that it makes your workflow a lot easier. Okay, so now let's go to project and insert a series of tempos. Okay, a different type of box comes up. And we're gonna start at measure eight. So we're gonna highlight that and type in eight. And we're gonna to highlight to measure 10. So we're gonna highlight that and uh, type 10. We're gonna begin at, at 120 and we're going to end at 100. We have a step adjustment but we're not going to cover that right now. We'll, a little bit later we'll, we will. 
So now we just inserted the tempo change. We're starting at 120, and then we're gonna gradually slow down as it goes. And by the time we get to 10, it should be at 100 again. So let's give this a listen. Now we're back down to 100. Okay, so the slowdown of the tempo is determined by the snap to grid function. And you can see right now it's set to 116. So whatever this is set to tells you how many steps is inserted in the slowdown, okay? We're gonna cover a little bit more detail here, but now we're gonna do another tempo change on measure 12. We'll move the uh, now time over there. And this time we're gonna do the tempo map. We're just gonna go over the views and go down to tempo. And now we've loaded the tempo map. And it's in the multi-dock, and you can see the console view on one side and the tempo view on the other. Now we can draw in our tempos, okay? So when we scroll back, you can see we've inserted the other tempos. Here's our first tempo change, and here's our gradual decline, and you'll see 16 of those as accordance with the snap the grid function. So if we right click on this and go down to 132, now the next time we insert a tempo change, it'll be 32 steps going down. Okay, so we're gonna raise the tempo back up to 120 at measure 12. Let's go ahead and insert another marker and we're gonna call that tempo change. You can number these if you want, but it's just is just an example. Okay. So here we are at 12. We're going to draw in our tempo. And we're going to mess it up. So, uh-oh, we're not where we need to be. So we just go to File and Undo. And we're going to try it again. It's a little bit harder to draw them. So just hold down our left mouse button and we're gonna drag up to measure 14. And we're gonna kind of fudge it a little bit right there. Okay. Now we have our tempo back at 120 or about that. So if we click past measure 12 or actually past 14, okay. So we see 120.59 and that's just a matter of click in there and just make it 120. And now we're back at 120. Now we drew the tempo in. Let's hear what we did. Okay. okay. Let's go ahead and close out the uh, tempo uh, map. And that's how you draw in temples. So now let's get something crazy going. Let's say when we get to measure 14, we want a time signature change, okay? All you would do is hit the time uh, signature for four and it opens up this box. And we're gonna go to measure 14 and we're gonna change the timing to uh, six, eight. And we're gonna change the key. Let's change the key to D. Okay, very good, okay. So now let's close this out. So now let's go back to 11 and give this a listen. You can do anything you want with timing. You have your tempo and your key signature and those three buttons that control the metronome. Anything can be accomplished. Now you may remember that earlier we've recorded the metronome in our audio track and there's really no way around that but there is a simple fix and what you have to do is pre-program your metronome and we're going to call up the console view and just kind of pull this up so you can see. Okay so we're going to start off by creating an audio track. Just right click and it routes to the master as you can see and we're going to route a signal from the metronome to the audio bus and to do this all you have to do is right click and then you go to new patch point 
then once we have that set, we go over to the audio track and go to the um, input section. And we select the new patch point as a source. It says patch point one. Now we have our choice of left and right, which is mono, or we can do a stereo click track. Usually a mono click track works just fine. So now we arm this for recording and just we record it. Okay, so we've just recorded a metronome track. Let's go ahead and check it out. Let's just pull this down so you can see it a little bit better. So let's pull this down a little bit further. So we have a click track that's recorded. We customized it first, then we recorded it in an audio track. Now we can shut off the metronome and we just use this click track and that prevents the metronome from being recorded in your audio. Dave's Live Sound says, how do you set up to monitor tracks during playback and to hear existing tracks while recording new tracks? Where do you route the master to and can the X32 monitor outs be fed? And Doug asks, can you route the cakewalk output back to the same channel it was recorded from? For instance, you recorded the bass on channel three, could you route it back to channel three? Okay, to understand this, we must understand routing. Now my Behringer X32 here has 40 hardware inputs and outputs. In addition to that, there's a USB card, that's your audio interface, has an additional 32 inputs and 32 outputs. Sort of independent, okay. Uh, that's a lot of signal flow to keep track of. But fortunately, Behringer has a signal routing system and that can be found in the routing button. Let's take a closer look. Okay, let's begin by opening up the Behringer app. We're going to go down to where it says X32 and double click. And then we're going to connect to the mixer using the ethernet connection. Okay, so now that we're connected, we're going to go ahead and minimize this. I'm going to call up uh, Cakewalk by BandLab. And then we're going to open up a project. Let's go to a new project and just do an empty project. And we're going to close out the inspector. I'm going to close out the browser, open up the multi-dock, and insert an audio track. And we're going to explain the hardware portion of things. I'm going to move the bus section over. And then we're going to drag out the hardware section. Here is our uh, app. And in our app, we can go to routing. And that's where we adjust all of our signal flow. And the card, you can see, has 32 outputs. Okay, and these can be switched on and off in our card configuration. So let's take a closer look at our card configuration. Okay, and we're going to set up and we go to our audio interface, our card over here. Okay, there's our Behringer card. And we have two inputs and two outputs. So in Cakewalk, what this basically means is if we pull out our hardware, we can see two outputs, a left and a right. So this is two stereo outputs, okay? So if we uh, go over here to where our uh, track is, we could see two inputs, a left and a right, or stereo, okay? So when we go back to our card configuration, we can change right here, and we're gonna change into eight in and eight out, okay? Once we do that, you notice that the audio engine has dropped out because it doesn't recognize the hardware right now. It needs to rewire everything, okay? So to do that, let's go up to um, hit the play button, I think. And now it's going to ask to rewire. We click yes. Now you see that we have eight outputs, okay? And uh, they're grouped in stereo, as you can see. Uh, and then we go over here, we can see we have the output uh, left and right, also grouped in stereo. And also the same thing for the inputs. We have eight inputs. Now we can use the first eight channels to record a track uh, in our Cakewalk application. Okay, so uh, let's go back to our hardware configuration again. And now we'll select 16 in, 16 out. This is our 16 outputs right here. Okay, 32 in, 32 out. This is 32 outputs that dragged us out. So now we have 32 outputs. We don't need 32 outputs, okay? Um, 
and then uh, you can see we have 32 inputs there these are outputs though but um, you can see as we go over here we also have 32 inputs and they're arranged by here's a one, uh, 1 through 32 with the option of stereo okay so if you're missing tracks and you have it on that setting make sure that everything is check marked in the driver section so some of these can be uh, unchecked and they'll be missing from cakewalk if they're uh, unchecked okay so let's go ahead and close this out and now we're going to go back to our card configuration and going to change this to what we really need which is 32 channels in and eight out you see our audio uh, engine dropout will appear now we only need um eight outputs to play back our audio and the Behringer mixer does everything in groups of eight okay so here's our eight outputs we're gonna kind of bring these over again okay and um, with 32 in we can record from ch any channel on the Behringer and then eight out allows us to hear back what we record so we're going to use these eight outputs to listen back to everything Okay, so here's a song I'm currently working on. I've written and recorded it. We have some basic drums and some basses and some guitars. Kind of a rough mix, if you can call it that. And here's our eight outputs that go to the uh, Behringer mixer. And uh, we're just going to play this. And as it begins to play, you'll see that the meters show that the song is playing back, but we can't hear anything. Now, to fix this, we need to go to the Behringer app. And the beautiful thing about this is I have both the app and Cakewalk open, and I can just go back and forth simply by clicking down here. Now, this is great because I don't have to run to the mixer every time I want to make an adjustment. I can do it right straight from the desktop, and this saves a lot of time, okay? So to fix this, we need to go up into routing. And notice when routing opens up, we're in the card, and we have all 32 outputs here, but we're only using the first eight outputs because the rest of them are shut off in our card configuration, if you remember. So to fix this, we need to go to inputs. I'm going to route our card outputs into inputs on the Behringer mixer, and we're going to use the first eight, one through eight, simply by clicking over here. And the minute we do that, you'll notice that our audio begins to appear down here. Okay, so what we've basically done is taken the first uh, eight outputs of the card and routed them to the first eight inputs of the mixer. And now when we turn up, you can see that we hear our song. Okay, let's turn our song down a little bit. And we're going through channels one and two on the Behringer mixer. Now to change that, we go to the master bus on Cakewalk. And as you can see, we'll just click on channel three to uh, change the routing. So here's channel one, channel two, and then channel three is right there. And when we click on that, notice that the sound stops. So we go back over to our Behringer mixer and we'll just turn up channel three. Now all the music is playing through channel three and we can turn down these other two channels over to Cakewalk and stop this playback. Okay, let's go back to our Behringer mixer. Now the first eight channels is being used by the card. We can't use it to record anything because the outputs of the card are going through the inputs of the Behringer mixer. We could still record on channels 9 through 16 though, but we've lost eight channels because we're hearing back our mix. Okay, so this can be fixed fairly easy too. We're going to go over to a Cakewalk again and we're going to start playing our song then let's go back to the behringer mixer and we're going to go to routing and we're going to uh, put, restore the inputs of channels one through eight and we're going to plug the card into inputs nine and 16 just by clicking like this okay so now we're good to go so if we close this out And then you'll see now we're in channel 11. Why are we in channel 11? So let's go to all and we'll just kind of bring this over and I'll show you. We need to go over to Cakewalk again. But first, let's go ahead and raise the volume on channel 11. Now we're using uh, channels 9 through 16 to play back the audio in Cakewalk, which means all of our routing numbers have changed. Channel 3 is channel 11. Channel 9 and 10 is actually channel 1 and 2. So when we click on this now, you see where this is where channel three was. So you just click on stereo, and now we're playing back through channels nine and channels ten. And we can just 
turn this down and turn these two channels up. Still not stereo, but we'll fix it here in a minute. I'll show you how to make the stereo, okay? So when you see this layout, we can now record on the first eight channels of the mixer, but nine through 16 we can't record on because the card is using the inputs of those channels to play back audio. So it won't work. So um, before we do anything else, go ahead and turn this off. And let's pull down these faders. Okay, we'll show you a solution to this problem here. Let's go up to routing. Okay, so I have the SD11 hooked up to my AES50B input. Basically, that gives you 16 extra channels of inputs and eight channels of outputs. Now, I'm showing you this because you don't need this in order for this solution to work. And some people will say it'll only work with that device, and you actually don't need that, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go up to channels nine and 16, and uh, we're gonna free those up, and we're gonna take the outputs of 17 and 24 and go into the card, okay? It doesn't matter whether you have this device or not, it doesn't affect this at all. This will still work, okay? So let's go down to our uh, cakewalk and start our audio again. And we're going to go back to our Behringer app. And now notice that we're coming through channels 17 and 18. Okay. So we go to um, channel 17, pull that up. And channel 18, and pull that up. Now we can use the first 16 channels of our X32 producer to record audio. And we monitor the playback through channels 17 and 18. And the next thing we need to do is make the stereo. I'll show you how to do that. Select 17. Click on stereo link. Okay. Now we're stereo. This is what it sounds like in the mix. We have our right pan, and our odd number has our even pan. We can mute it because it's linked. That's basically how routing works. You use the master bus and cakewalk to uh, control the eight outputs of the card on the Behringer mixer. Fairly simple, just play with it and you'll figure out how it works soon enough. Hopefully this has pointed you in the right direction. Our last question comes from Danny and he says, I'm still not able to get sound from my X32 board to my Windows and Mac computers. I installed XUSB drivers as suggested. My Windows computer recognizes the X32 drivers connection. However, I can't seem to hear any sound in computer coming from the X32 XUSB card. Other than routing, did you change settings in the global tab? I'm trying to capture my live stream sound coming out of buses 11 and 12 going into OBS. For those who don't know, OBS stands for Open Broadcaster Software, and like Cakewalk, it's totally free. It's basically a portable TV studio you download onto your computer and allows you to stream to places like YouTube, Twitch, uh, Facebook, and a host of other streaming platforms. It includes effects like green screen and transitions, it really makes your Facebook live stream stand out, and uh, it's a perfect solution for churches. I hate to be the one to tell you this, but the fix for this does not work on a Mac. Cakewalk doesn't work on a Mac either. Sure, there might be a workaround, but it's not going to be without its issues and its problems and its bug fixes. You're better off with a PC for this. Just trust me on this one. And with that in mind, let's look at the solution. The reason why the Behringer X32 will not work inside of OBS is because OBS will not recognize ASIO drivers, and that is a big problem. In Windows, OBS only recognizes the WAS API drivers. Now, any audio interface that uses ASIO, and all the good ones do, will not work inside of OBS by default. But there is a fix for this, and it's found in a plugin that only works in Windows. Let me show you. Okay, let's start by opening up your browser, going to whatever search engine you may want to use, and type in ASIO OBS. That's all you have to do. I'll leave a link in the video description. And the very first thing that comes up, just go ahead and click on that. Now that we're at GitHub, you can see our ASIO driver. Let's go ahead and click on the releases, and we want to download the most current release, get the execution file.exe extension. Downloads pretty quickly. 
And uh, once we have this downloaded, we're going to just install it. Fairly simple, right? So let's go ahead and close this out and go to our download folder. So now that our download folder comes up, we're going to go to uh, downloads and you can see our ASIO extension. Go ahead and click on that and just go ahead and do the install. And it installs fairly quickly. Once it's done installing, we got to call up OBS. Okay, so once OBS is uh, up, we can click on settings and we can go over to audio. And you can see here's all of our audio devices. Now, if you choose one and change that to the Behringer mixer, you'll see the Behringer mixer listed, but it will not work because this is still using the Windows drivers. You have to use the plugin extension in order to get ASIO to work. In order to use a mixer, you need the plugin. Okay, so we're just going to go ahead and reset this back to the real tech speakers and um, whatever your default speakers are. Go ahead and right click and set up a source and click on ASIO. When that comes up, go ahead and select OK. And now you have to select a device. So in here is where you're going to uh, select your Behringer X32. Okay, so we have channels 1 and channels 2. Okay, or actually track one, track two, we're in stereo. If we go to 2.1, you can see that we have now three tracks that we can record with. If we go to 7.1, now we have eight tracks we can use to record audio from our mixer. Just select this little arrow thing, and you can select any channel from the Behringer to record any track you want. Fairly simple. So you have eight tracks you can use to record with, with various microphones, and you just route this any way you want. Fairly simple. Okay, so once this is set up the way you want it to be set up, then uh, all you would do is uh, click OK. And see, here's our, our ASIO all set up. And now let's go ahead and play something. Okay, now that we're getting audio playing back from our Behringer mixer, we can change the way the mixer looks inside OBS. Simply go over to the sprocket, which is nothing more than an icon for settings, and go to vertical layout. And so here's a vertical layout of our mixer. So if we go to uh, the sprocket again and go to advanced audio properties, you can see here's all the audio devices that are in your computer that OBS recognizes, ASIO being at the top. So you click on the monitor off and go to monitor output. And now you can see that the uh, output in the ASIO is being shared and fed into all the other audio devices. We still need a way to monitor our mixes because our ASIO driver only works on the inputs, it does not work on the output, so there's no way to monitor it. So let's fix that now. Okay, I have two short cables here. One side is XLR and the other side is quarter inch jack. I'm gonna unplug the monitors. I'm gonna take one cable and go to the monitor right output. And I'm gonna go into the input of channel eight on the Behringer mixer. And with the other cable, I'm going to go to the left monitor output and I'm gonna go into channel seven on the input of the Behringer mixer. This concludes the very first Behringer Cakewalk Q&A session. Now, if you find this information helpful, I would ask that you please like and subscribe. Hit the bell notification so you will be notified of new videos when they are released. Now, if I did not get to your question and I did not get to your comment, rest assured they'll be addressed in the next video. In the meantime, if you have more questions, if you have more tips that you figured out on your own, feel free to leave those in the comment area. In addition to that, if you think that you would like to see a detailed video on OBS, leave that in the comment area and I will work on that after the Cakewalk series is done, okay? Now, as always, I appreciate your support and thank you for watching.